So if you ask me in elementary or middle school what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would have said either a wizard, an astronaut, or a writer. Now, a wizard and astronaut were a few years in the making, but a writer definitely seemed to be an accessible connection. I love creative writing, I love writing short stories about anything from ranging from dragons to phoenixes, basically anything that wasn't human because I found humans to be far too boring. But then, over time, when I got into high school, I saw the endless opportunities available through programming, and that's what got me into computer science. Now, you might think, what's interesting with computer science, especially when you come from something like humanities? Well, for me, it was the idea that I could build something larger than myself. Weaving together a sequence of code was much like deconstructing the components of a sentence. It was making something greater out of something that was small. That's, that's also what led me into artificial intelligence, which is a field that's really developing recently because it can be applied to a variety of sectors. And so in the future, I want to go into artificial intelligence, but once I learned more about it, I saw that a lot of the things that fuel this field also come from where the problems align with it. So, as part of this talk, I'll be discussing the issue of underrepresentation in artificial intelligence. But in a broader sense, I'd also like to highlight how important diversity is in innovation and how the two can work together and, and have great results. So this past summer at the University of Iowa, I had the opportunity to work in uh, Professor Denise Sage's lab in the Department of Computer Science, where I helped develop autonomous navigation models using a subset of machine learning called reinforcement learning. And this was a great experience for me because I learned that I could help build these AI models. It wasn't just watching from the sidelines, it was actively building these models, it was creating them, testing them, analyzing the results, even presenting my findings to like a couple of mediums. And that was a great cost for me because I could see how I could be involved in the field in a greater capacity. At the same time, I was also writing articles about how artificial intelligence could be applied through a variety of fields for various uh, student-led organizations. So for example, I talked about machine learning research and how it was used for popular fields that you might not think about at first. So for example, climate change, wildlife, wildlife conservation, archaeology. Those aren't fields that you primarily think of technology to work with, but they were fields that I found to be fascinating because it showed how I myself had come from the humanities and somehow transitioned into technology and found a way in the middle where I could use both. So while I was doing my research, I found a few startling statistics, especially when I was investigating the gender disparity in computer science. 12%. Just 12% of AI researchers are female. I'd like to pause and think about that for a second. <coughs> Machine learning is a field that primarily is based on the data. So the way models are developed is that you start with a set of data, you generate a model, and then you get some results. And then you compare the results you receive with the ones you predicted to obtain. Now this, this discrepancy that we see is usually what we want to analyze. But what happens when the training data is flawed? Well, according to the World Economic Forum, biases can be reflected in models. How does that happen? Well, if you have flawed training data, you'll see flawed results. And then in between, that's what we want to study. We want to see why these models act this way. And usually, you can see it reflected in the training data itself. Susan Levy, who is a research fellow at the University of College Dublin, conducted a study where she examined the gender associations of words contextually in like a series of tests. And she found that certain models did reflect gender biases. So for example, in situations where the term woman would have been appropriate, these models use the term girl more often. And this error seemed to occur much less frequently with the, when a boy was used instead of a man. So this makes me wonder, why does this happen? Well, stereotypes are prevalent, present in various forms of diction. If you look at uh, metaphors, descriptions, every type of stylized language, you can see how stereotypes are reflected, which leads to the idea that models do, and models are capable of learning gender bias. Just take a look at the hiring tool that Amazon used in 2018. What essentially occurred was that a model was based off of no, a model used training data that existed that consisted of uh, candidates, um, sorry, resumes from male candidates. And as a result, the model tended to undervalue resumes that contained words related to female. So for example, women's colleges. And as a result, many older <coughs> sexual women were overlooked. Now Amazon did apologize for the mistake, but we have to see what this demonstrates. It's incredibly possible for, uh, for flawed models to be generated, and we don't want to be there when that happens. <coughs> so we also need to see why we need diversity in tech. Well, a lot of models used nowadays are used for, series, for cases where there are large amounts of data. So diversity in tech is essentially important. For example, models, according to Forbes, models used in communities of color tended to overpredict the rate in which criminals were expected to reoffend or commit another crime. So when these models are used in law enforcement, there could be a lot of problems at risk. Additionally, facial recognition technology, which we use in many cases, from anywhere from uh, unlocking your iPhone to law enforcement, can be incredibly um, undervalued. However, the problem is that the training data that goes into facial recognition often makes it so it's not as especially as accurate for women and minorities, largely because of the lack of representative tra training data. 
So this quote by Olga Rosikowski, who is an assistant professor at Princeton, as well as a co-founder of AI for All, demonstrate this issue very well. <laughs> AI researchers are a fairly homogenous population, so it's a challenge to think about any world issues. There are a lot of opportunities to diversify this pool, and as diversity grows, the AI systems themselves will become less biased. Researchers in the United Kingdom have demonstrated how this could work. One of the solutions they advocate is making organizations that help promote women by making collaborative communities. And that's a solution that I really advocate for as a uh, member of these, some of these communities. However, we must also examine how essential diversity is going forward. We're building a world where we will rely a lot on the vast computational <coughs> power that AI models have. Think about the different applications of it. Cancer research, cancer research, cybersecurity, climate change. These are all areas that could benefit by the use of, by the, use of the broad computational power that AI models, AI models have. As we move into a future that increasingly relies on these models, we must consider their applications in the real world. So, as we keep moving forward, we have to build a future that relies on diversity and uses its strengths to make a better world for all of us to live in. So, let's look at the training data data from the past and build a future where models can help us build the social change that we want to see. Thank you.